Okay. So, oh. Hello, world, and welcome to Street PX Photography Podcast. This is episode number 54, uh, Friday, December 15th. My name is Casper, and while Jim is usually here to my side, unfortunately he's not here today. He's out and about doing his photography thing. But fear not, we will have him back on the next episode as we bring in Jacques McDonald and also give a quick recap, a quick year in review of all of our interviews and events and all those Street PX happenings over the course of 2017. Now today, uh, we have an episode where I'm sitting down with Steve Dissenhoff. This is a great interview, everybody. He's an East Coast turn, West Coast photographer with a heart of gold, and he's here to tell his story, including a fascinating program he works with at the residential boarding school in Kenya, including fundraising to buy equipment and uh, a process of creating workshops to spread the power of technology and photography to girls who otherwise qualify but sadly cannot afford to go to high school. It, 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 it's an amazing, amazing program, and we get down into how it works and how it came to be. And, and we find this one to be very inspiring. We hope that it inspires you to get out there and use your talents to spread knowledge and opportunity for others. Uh, we also want to bring up Catchlight. Catchlight is an organization that tracks down visual storytellers and works to bring their imagery uh, to the world. And now uh, we bring this up because Catchlight uh, every year they offer a fellowship program to three lucky photographers and um, the application process is actually starting on January 1st. Now, even if you've never applied for grants or fellowships before, if you've got a project, this is there's no better time than now to start. So pull your work together, uh, start typing, and head over to catchlight.io. These are $30,000 grants, and you get to collaborate with the media partners and Catchlight to help complete that uh, proposed project that you know has been sitting on the shelf for a while waiting on some money and some help. Uh, they also have a, a great event coming up in January discussing the Tender Souls project. And we were lucky enough to get uh, Brenton uh, Gazer in here to talk to us about the program and uh, uh, about the project, rather, and um, and tell us a little bit more about what it entails. It's actually focused on the Tenderloin in San Francisco and the people that, that live in that area. And uh, that's going to be the show that helps us kick off our 2018 season. We couldn't be prouder about it. Um, anyway, oh, it's sponsorship love time. So all of our friends over at Glass key photo these guys have been so great to us over the last year and we hope you can help us return the favor with a quick visit to their shop that's over at 1230 Sutter Street now if you're looking for you know new film cameras or repairs on your old gear if you're looking for experimental film or just need to top off that thinning box of Tri-X that's been chilling in the fridge that's the place to head over to. They got countless bits of used gear, zines made by artists here in the Bay Area, and all around great conversation. So head over to Glass Key there, right on Sutter Street off of Van Ness in kind of midtown San Francisco. Uh, now for a couple of uh, exhibits for you folks over here in San Francisco as well as over in London. First is Almost True. Now this is a photography exhibit that's matched with a book release by our friend Steve Bowman. You might remember him as a previous guest here on Street PX. Um, this is going down at the Leica Store, San Francisco at 463 Bush Street. The exhibit is going to be running from January 8th to February 10th. But uh, most importantly, there is an artist reception and book launch going on on Thursday, January 11. So I know I will be there. I know Jim will be there. Of course, Steve will be there, as well as many photographers from the Bay Area and kind of surrounding uh, region here. So definitely a great opportunity to come, see amazing work, uh, meet Steve, see his book, pick up his book and get some get, get some autographs, too. Uh, let's see. Also, American Black and White. So if you folks over in London at the Magnum Photos print room, that's 63 G Street, um, there is a amazing London-based exhibition presenting uh, port, uh, what's, what they call it, a portrait of America's past and present through the lenses of Magnum photographers Matt Black and Elliot Erwitt. This is running until February 23rd. I believe it's already live now. Uh, more information on these two exhibits will, of course, be in our show notes. Beyond that, don't forget to drop us a review over on iTunes or on iHeartRadio. You can also let us know how we're doing by joining our Street PX Lounge on Facebook. 
or emailing us at contact at streetpx.com. Either way, we don't care how you do it, how you reach out to us, but please do so. We love hearing from our listeners. Of course, our wonderful Patreon account, you can toss us a few bucks uh, you know, each month and help us keep these episodes coming to your ears. Our online shop with countless t-shirt designs, uh, a number of different cameras, funny quotes, different things like that. Things to put a smile on the face of that shutter bug in your life. Um, and both of these items can be found from our streetpx.com website. Uh, last but not least, a big thank you to our secret print exchange participants. We had so many signups this year and already prints have begun flying around the globe and so awesome to see. And we can't wait to start receiving those selfies, you know, selfie photos with your new prints. So don't forget uh, participants to send those to us. Above all, folks, happy holidays and safe travels this season. I know I'm going to be flying, so make sure you pack your gear well, check in early and, uh, and, and get to where you're going safely. Now, enough of all this. Let's start our talk with Steve Dissenhoff. Um, maybe sure. kind of back and forth. And, a and just bit. give you an idea. Um, yeah. You know, when I look back at my photography, which is interesting, I, I'm, I'm talk about this. I digitized some old eight millimeter films last week, and there's one of me, two years old, my dad setting me up in front of a tripod with his with his SLR. Really? I was like, and I literally posted on Facebook and said, "This is where it started." <laughs> So, so two years old? Two years old. <laughs> but, you know, from there until like the 90s, it was mostly snapshots. Uh-huh. Uh, lots, of photo- lots of photos, but sh- snapshots. And it wasn't until I started doing sports in the mid-90s with my kids and dance with my kids that I started having more of the thought of like, I, there's more of an art to this and there's an eye to this. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about my photography, it's the last 15 years. But in rea- you know, reality, it's 60 some odd years, but... Um, so there's that piece of all the way through the social work days and shooting on the streets of Boston as a social worker. And then there's this gap and of all point and shoots. And then it's coming back out as a Konica Minolta and then Sony fanboy in the mid nineties to now. Mm-hmm. So I, just so you know that. Yeah. It's funny you say the Minolta cause that's, I've got about half a dozen of them. Oh, is that this. right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, Minolta was my jam uh, yeah. as I was coming into photography. The first one I had was a three, uh, the 370 and then yep. the uh, 700. Okay, uh, um, that's kind of my 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 crown jewel, my Minolta, uh, my my X 700. Yeah, um, but you were okay. So you, yeah, no, no worries. We can actually roll with that. Yeah. Um, as far you had made the mention about the social work, um, the, so that's something that you. So you're originally from Philadelphia? Re- originally from uh, New York and Boston. Oh, so you're straight up in the New England area. Yeah, then. yeah. But, okay. But, yeah, I met my wife in Boston when I was in grad school, and she was in undergrad. Okay. Did you go to school for photography? Or? Uh, social work. Social work, straight through. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Self, yeah. So self-taught as photographer, yeah. As, as as most of us are yeah. these days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what took you into social work? Was there anything in particular that, that guided uh-huh. your- I was an engineering head? student at Penn State mm-hmm. um, until- uh, like the weekend after Kent State in 1970 mm-hmm. and got politicized and was out in the streets for three years. Uh, decided uh, there's a there's a there's a very humorous story I will not tell here <laughs> about me deciding to switch from engineering into psychology back then. Right. And then I followed a girlfriend into social work, does a second degree. I got two undergraduate majors, which is a lot more impressive than it sounds. Oh, so you followed the girl into I followed the girl. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know, um, after the 72 elections, decided if I was going to change the world, it was going to be one person at a time and ended up, I mean, I had hair down to here. I had a beard that was like this. Nice. Um, and for five years was a street counselor. I did uh, work with runaways and pimps, prostitutes, cons, whoever was on the street. Wow. Trying to get to the runaways and get them off the street before they, they get into the street life. Right. And during that time, went back on an MB, uh, MSW, uh, Master of Social Work. And then followed my wife's career to Philadelphia, where she's in med school, out here for residency. And we basically have stayed here since. Oh, fantastic. So you've been out in the Bay Area for a while. Since then. 1980, yeah. Since 1980. Now, um, just kind of- re- I'm going to skew your demographic higher, by the way. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We got a pretty significant size portion here in uh, the Bay Area. And, yeah. and quite interestingly enough, in the uh, New England area too, New York and yeah. all of that. Now- um, Something I noticed through your your work, you had made a comment there about running with, uh, working with the runaways and the shelters and everything. Is there anything you want to describe about that? Just kind of how that 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 life kind of went. It seems to me that that's something that can significantly 
uh, affect and inspire you for the future. For yeah. Photography. Yeah. You know, I've always been a, a voyeur at heart, I think. I mean, I love watching people, love mm -hmm. working with people. Um, even now, over the last few years, as I've, uh, my street work, have moved from taking more candid shots to more portraits and stopping people on the street. And people look at me and say, well, you know, how do you, the people that are in my group that I take out on the street, they go, I, I, I don't want to talk to anybody. It's like, right. you know, how do I do that? You know, can you give me a long lens? And you know, They're going to hit me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I go out these days and I shoot with a 28 millimeter lens and I mm -hmm. walk up to people and there's people you know right away. Uh, they don't want their picture taken. Yeah. Don't, don't even try. And there's other people who are just interesting and there's a variety of ways of walking up to them. And uh, some are you see something and you take a picture and you walk up to them and you show them and you go, hey, look, I just took this. Isn't this, isn't this cool? And they go, oh, yeah, I love that. Can I, do you mind if I take another one? Could you move over here? Turn turn this way. And you got yourself a street portrait. Kind of build yourself a rapport with the person. and Exactly. You know, yeah. Exactly. And others where you see something like um, a great example of this. I had taken a couple of people out on the street a few uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm going into one of the alleys that I know in San Francisco. And here's a guy sitting in front of a, a shop and he's reading a book and there's reflected light off the window across the street from him that's lighting him up. Oh, Beaut you get that beautiful, beautiful shot. Kind oh, of awesome. Natural beauty dish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's got blue hair. And he's and he's smoking a uh, you know, a what an electric pipe, electric cigarette. Electric yeah. cigarette. And so I walk up to him and I go, gosh, you know, this, and I point across the street and says, this light is lighting you up. I don't know if you noticed that, but you've got this gorgeous light over here. And he looks up and goes, oh, yeah. I said, and I love your hair. Do you mind if I take a few pictures of you? He's like, and my friends are sitting on the other side of the street going, I can't believe he's doing this. And I say, he goes back to reading his book and I take some pictures. And of course I get home and I look and what he's got is a graphic novel of Star Wars. What he's wearing as a t-shirt is is basically Star Wars. This guy's in his, he's probably late 30s. I mean, we're not talking about a 20 year old. Right. Um, he's, I mean, this guy is totally duded up as Star Wars. And then I've got him, of course, with the smoke coming out of his mouth mm -hmm. and the blue hair. And that's kind of a typical, it really is almost a typical approach to somebody these days on the street. If you see somebody interesting, mm -hmm. go walk up to him, take their picture. And the worst that can happen is they say no. No, it, it's interesting. I, I know there's kind of two camps with this. It's as far as the uh, those that are for interaction and those that like to stay more behind the background or um, uh, from afar, mm -hmm. uh, not voyeuristic afar in, yeah, in that yeah. regard. I mean, just not interacting. So you like to take that interaction approach. Do you uh, generally take your picture beforehand and then speak with them to, to avoid uh, um, kind of affecting the scene or do you not mind about it, that? It can be a little bit of either. It really... Um, you know, Valerie Jardin talks about going out empty. Mm -hmm. So I'm going out with any preconcept without any preconceptions. Just throw um, it all in the wind, see what yeah, happens. If I, if I see something happening, and the nice part about this after doing street work for street photography for several years now is there are a variety of techniques, a variety of things that I, I see on the street. And so now, rather than have to think about, oh, what setting am I going to use? How am I going to approach this? Some of it's become instinctual. Some mm -hmm. of it's just part of my toolbox of here's here's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. After a while, that experience just kind of turns into repetitive motor memory. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The settings on a camera, that's something that can easily be overcome. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. it's just looking for a scene to come up. And it, it's a really good point because a lot of times if you go out with a preconception with this kind of pre-planning, then you're going to miss a lot as you move along because you kind of get that narrow vision, exactly. that tunnel vision rather. That's exactly right. I definitely try to avoid yeah. that, but it's not to say that I don't run into it often. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, if, if you go back to my social work. Yes, yes. Kind of um, rotate back there. My, I, I worked for a small social service. Um, gosh, I did this as, as a uh, an internship when I was, my last semester in college was, uh, went from school to Boston, took this position with a, a more conservative um, social work agency. And housed in their basement was this counterculture agency, seven people run by two nun, by four nuns called Bridge Over Troubled Waters. It's still there in Boston. Um, it's grown Im immensely since, since back then. But I was one of three street counselors. One of them was Sister Barbara uh, Scanlon, and then myself and one other guy. Mm -hmm. And our job was to go out from two in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night, walk the streets of Boston, look for runaways, get to know um, the homeless, the the pimps, the prostitutes, the cons, the people who were out there, make contact with them, refer them when we could to some social service, 
but also encourage them to point out runaways to us so that we could get to them in the first two or three weeks before they got into the street life and they were you know, irreconcilably on the, on the street. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, sh a, uh, a network of, of group of homes we could put them in and then return them to family or get them hooked up with the services they needed. This was back in the day where the streets were just changing from the flower kids running towards something to the more distressed kids running away from a bad family situation. So returning to their families wasn't always the best option. Mm -hmm. And I would meet 50, 60 people a day. Um, I had a little pouch that I carried that had my darts in it and also had a little black book in it that I kept my notes in. Darts? I was a I was a competitive dart player when I was oh. back then. <laughs> it was a big thing in New England. Right, still right. is. Yes, it is. Yes, any um, bar that you go in. It's, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was my you know eleven o'clock at night when you get off work. What else are you going to do, right? Could go and throw darts. Wasn't a drinker, but I could go throw darts. <laughs> so um, anyway, I I talked to 50, 60 people a day, which you know wow. translates now into being more comfortable walking up to somebody on the street, and you know it's not my persona to be that out there, mm -hmm. but. It was good practice. Were you an outgoing person before you got into this, or was this something that you just kind of did to, as a means to an end? I don't think I ever saw myself as an outgoing person. I'm not that. Just discovered it. Whatever, discovered it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and frankly, I met my wife doing that. I picked her up online at a bank. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Still a great story. Online at a bank? Uh, she was in front of me and uh, she had a cute- Oh, in line. In oh, line. Oh, gotcha. oh, yeah. Every, everyone says, well, online at a bank? No, no. There was no online back then. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, I'm going to skew your demographic a little older here. So you just kind of tapped on the shoulder and was like, I just Hi there. said throughout the, you know, the, one of those lines to her, like literally was, are you a student? You know, she had, a, she had a, both hands, like full books. <laughs> Definitely a <Yeah>. student. <laughs> and- uh, no, a few minutes later, asked her out and we went out and it's one of those things where she was like, you know, everybody I meet is through college and I, here's this guy with stars on his sneakers and, you know, long hair picking me up and whatever. She literally on her first date left a note saying, if I don't come back, I, this is the guy I went out with. And the only thing that saved me was the next morning, uh, Sunday morning, I was on the front page of the Boston Globe magazine section because they did a big article on our free medical van. And here I was, and legitimate. Wow. So, and that was 40, I don't know, 45 years ago. Oh, so you're coming up on, ago. what is that, that uh, 50 is the gold, I think? Somebody, well, that's 42 after we met. Right. Th yeah, we've got a ways to go for the 50. Now, just kind of rotate yeah. back. Uh, um, how receptive, whenever you were out in the streets like this, how receptive were people as far as, like you were saying, you were tracking down runaways and they were relaying the information? Yeah. Um, did you run into a lot of conflict or were people very uh, amicable to this? Most people were amicable. Yeah. There were, you know, there's, um, there is that alpha male. Of course. Mostly that male. pride. This is my territory. Yeah. Yeah. Most of those were the ex-cons. Um, we were not turning them in. We were not. Uh, you know, an, an arm of the police. They knew that we had legitimacy from um, being out there for a while. Uh, I was also working with four nuns, and you, it's like you know, <laughs> it's hard in, to say no to a nun in, in, in very Catholic <laughs> Boston. It's like when and oh yeah, uh, you know, when the sister says this, and they were not in habits. They were they were actually originally shunned by their order, who said we don't want you doing this until they became successful, and then the order couldn't get enough of oh, this is our. Yeah, our, this is these are our sisters. Mm, accept them after the things. Been yeah, established. yeah, oh, yeah. That's fine. Uh, but in the middle of this, I bought a. Um, I, I think I was telling you, I, yeah, I'd had cameras early on. I think I had a Kodak Brownie. Mm -hmm. uh, my first camera, I really remember. <laughs> I got one of those. Do you really? <laughs> yes, <I do. laughs> the first camera I remember in middle school was an Olympus Pennies half frame. Oh, I love those. I loved it. Camera. Yes. What is it? Turns like a thirty six into a, a seventy two. Seventy two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that camera. And then I had no camera for a while in college. Um, and then on the street, I bought a Miranda uh, SLR with a f uh, Nifty 50 and a 135. Mm -hmm. Shot th with that for a couple of years. Oh, so you were shooting while you were working, doing I, social yes, work. Yeah, here. so I actually have some slides from back then of and people I still remember. I still remember their names from like their you know, mid-70s. Oh, wow. And had to set up a dark room in my bathroom and develop stuff there. Although I didn't have an, couldn't afford an enlarger, so everything I did was either contact prints or or slides. And then sold the camera in the mid seventies to take flying lessons. Got a, my pilot's license, and uh, did that for a bunch of years until we moved out to California. And then I, it was a choice of 
well, dear, we could buy a house or you could keep flying. And mm. I, I wasn't going to ever win that one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Give that one up right out of the gate. That's okay, right. Okay, it's a house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> back when you could buy one. Back when you could buy. Oh, yeah, exactly. Back when you buy one. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly the norm these days, unfortunately. No. no. Um, so you did. So, but you did have your flying license, though. You just didn't. I had a pilot's license. I flew all uh, while we were on the East Coast mm-hmm. until 1980, 81. Um, um, I flew a lot. You're right. Um, actually, have um, I had a point and shoot back then after after the Miranda, and actually have one flight that I took by myself down the middle of the Hudson River, and was pointing out. There's a little. Um, it's a little tunnel that you can fly through right down the middle of the Hudson, and so I've got both. Of, eight millimeter films and pictures of the New York skyline from a, from lower than the buildings. That's, yeah. Yeah, I don't, can you even do that anymore? You I can't. think the fly zone is, you'll get shot down. You probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially in New York. That's right. These days. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you keep up with, uh, keep in touch with any of the people that you met in the streets this way? Like to know if any of them, you know, went on for better, greater things. I, I occasionally um, have met, people through Facebook, not so much from Boston. I have a uh, foster child that I was working with in Philadelphia who is uh, now living in Southern Cal. He told me a few months ago that his decision to be an engineer was because he knew I had been an engineering student at Penn State. He went to Penn State, became an engineer. He's now living in Southern Cal. He's got kids. He's in his, gosh, late 40s. He's an actor. Wow. Um, it blows me away. I mean, I just, whatever. I've had another kid who com- also found me on Facebook and, hey, I just want you to know, whatever. And you don't realize the imp- impact you have on someone's life. Mm-hmm. And especially as a social worker, you know, you meet somebody, you work with them for a while, they disappear, you never hear from them again. It's just fact of life. And Facebook, you know, between actually making contact with childhood friends and and keeping track with my cousins on the East Coast or these people that I've met along the way uh, is, is one of those things where, you know, gosh, it's it's a different world we live in. It was a turning point, really. Yeah. I mean, as far as like creating that bridge, you don't really you yeah. know, think about it. It's just on your phone, shoot out a message. You can kind of stay in contact that way. That's that's, right. that's brilliant, though. Yeah. And somebody that came through successfully, feel free if you want to do a shout no. out. You know? <laughs> Bobby Williams. Hey. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And, and the fact that they, they went so far to be pulled out from so low. Yeah, I mean, because I it, have you continued this out here in San Francisco? I'm, I'm sorry to continue no, the no. subject; it's just fascinating to me. The, the which part? Uh, the social work, as far as working with. Um, yeah, I was a um, when we moved out here. Um, I worked in a couple with developmental disabilities for a couple of years, right? And then I took a job as uh, first a clinician, and then ultimately I was the director of a day treatment program at Edgewood Children's Center in the city. I was there for about seven years. Left when our daughter was born, Mm -hmm. uh, became an at-home parent, at-home dad for eight and a half years. One of the, um, not one of the first there, but certainly we weren't common Mm -hmm. to the point where every Father's Day, um, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7 would come out and interview us. (laughs) Here's the day. I know that one guy. Specifically, that's exactly (laughs) what they do. I was one of two guys in the 200 member, member Southern Marin Mothers Club. I mean, this was a different life. So they just keep flipping back between you two for the different features. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so just go, just go, Steve. He'll do the interview. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. And, um, then got an MBA while I was home and went to work for a financial company. Um, ended up as a partner and retired uh, a year and a half ago. Right um, Congratulations. Thank you. Kind of opens up some time to focus on the camera a little bit more. Huh? Well, on the camera, I'm also do- I've also been doing volunteer work all through this time. Speaking of, yeah. that's actually a great segue because co- coming from that social work, I'm sure that's played a huge role in uh, where you've taken your photography today, what you point your lens at, mm-hmm. and uh, and do your travel work. Yeah, um, Kenya. Yeah, yeah, yes. So this is this is one that if you would ever ask me whether I'd be involved in Africa, um, I, a few years ago I would have said seriously. I mean, uh, is it, where does this place? come from? <laughs> yeah, where does this come from? And what happened was my son came back from uh, junior year in high school and said, um, met these folks and I'm going to go and go to Kenya next summer. Oh, so he went abroad completely. We, well, he, he said, no, he, he came back and said, I met these people. I want to go to Kenya. Mm-hmm. And I said, the heck you will. And knowing s- a little, just a little bit about, you know, this is after the first elections. And maybe I was going to say, this is just a different had, time. Well, you know, and- they, right now, Kenya had these elections that were v- invalidated a couple weeks ago. They had another election. 
And it all goes back to around 2007 when they had a million people displaced after an election, very disputed election. It's all tribal there. And this had just happened when he came home and said, I'm going there. And he said, and he said, no, you need to meet these people. Um, they started a school. Uh, they're from Marin. They started a residential boarding school for um, poor girls who have qualified for high school but can't afford to go. That if the family can afford to even send one kid, you know, sell the goat, send one kid, they're going to send the son. Or the girl's going to get married off at 13 or 14. Right. And, 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 and. And um, he said, I saw this video and and here's this girl saying, I'd like to succeed in life, but I've never touched a computer. And my son says, Dad, we can do something about this. So between him and my wife, and she was the prime mover on a lot of this, we raised about 10 grand. We uh, bought, uh, we went to Best Buy, and I'll, I'll put in a plug for them because they gave us at discount, a discount off of their price, 15 laptops. Um, we went to my photography club, people donated cameras, because what do you do with a computer if you've never touched a computer before? Well, you can take pictures, you can download them, and then you can use a mouse to edit them. And you kind of learn the structure and the way a computer operates exactly. in the process. Yeah. So we then met with a guy who was uh, teaching seniors to use computers, at figuring who else could help us design a, a, cl uh, a workshop to introduce new people to computers. And yeah, then we because, went, I mean, most people have some type of interaction yeah, at or, some point or these technology days. at least. Yes, yeah. in general, so these people do not. These are kids from either the slums of uh, you know, uh, of uh, Nairobi or they're from Maasai. You know, they're out traveling with their animals and go, they're pastoralists and, and, and change that's part of the tribe. There, part of the that, tribe. That's a, that's a people, a culture. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we put together this workshop. We went to Kenya for three weeks and we taught introduction to computers, introduction to photography. Um, and it went so well that, you know, and I went kind of cynically thinking, you know, I'll go, I'll, I'll accompany my son. Yeah, you know, I know people, I'll get whatever. I came back thinking I had 52 daughters. I mean, I was, and we, we ended up, my family ended up sponsoring one of those young women who's now a senior in college. Um, we went back the next year. We brought 14 high school kids from Marin with us. We did it all again, except expanded what we were doing. And then in 2013, I went back by myself to teach. There's a mandatory gap year in Kenya. You take the college boards. And now people in the U.S., when you think about this, now here we want to go to, we want to, go to college. We have our grades from high school. We've got our recommendation letters. We've got our community service. We've got our SATs. In Kenya... You sit down for one month-long exam that covers everything in eight core subjects that you learn from the day you walked in as a freshman till the day you walk out as a senior. And depending on how that exam you do on that exam, one exam, and if you're sick, tough. Um, and they've got an armed guard there. Um, and they've got a proctor from the state who's doing this all. No cheating. Bang, bang. No cheating. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, depends on whether you get to go to college, whether you get whether you qualify to begin with whether you get scholarships or loans. 85% um, of our girls, um, now this is since 2009, 85% of our girls have qualified for university. We through were, your program. Through our program. We have 32 out of the 42 tribes represented. We have all the major religions. We take the tribes and specifically intermix the girls in their dorms so that they have to get along with everyone else. And then we have a four-year women's empowerment program that's part of this that we've developed. And it's... You know, of all the, th all the social work, all the things I've ever been involved with in my life, this one has had more impact on people than any other one. So, you know, the photography piece um, has been, you know, the girls still, I mean, they're, they're out there taking photos. They're, I was going to ask, as far as that, that arm of it, are they still, is there a big focus on the photography side to, to help them kind of develop a vision? Or there is definitely a fo There's definitely a focus. The girls who are interested in it, in fact, there's a picture that showed up not too uh, about a week ago on Taraja's site is of a girl who's in college with a video camera. I mean, a, a serious, like a full on, a full on camera. CBS news. <laughs> exactly. And that's what they want to do. That's, right. what, that's what these girls are motivated to do. Um, I mean, I'm convinced the girls in the school will be running the country in a few years. Uh, and two of the girls actually are coming back, have come back to teach. One's teaching English lit here in America. No, at the school in, in Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. And we have a couple of girls. We do have a couple of girls who are, who are actually in college here in the U.S. whose, whose sponsors have 
who've worked things out for them to be here. But most of them go to school in Kenya. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, I mean, ha- how long has this program been ongoing for now? 2009. 2009, so coming up on the 10-year mark. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, it sounds like the students were in- incredibly excited and receptive whenever you pulled this. Is this mostly they're, rural area? Or is this it, we're, in a fair, we're in a rural, rural area. The girls are mostly, I mean, they're all poor kids, so they're coming from r- rural areas or they're coming from the slums in Nairobi. Yeah. Is this an area that has uh, any, like, that's constantly battling uh, ailment or anything like that um, going on? Or? There's no, there's, it's a fairly peaceful area, mm-hmm. but we have a, uh, under 90 acres, we have an electrified fence around it because the elephants come down to the river next door. Um, that was going to be my next question is the wildlife. <laughs> there, yep. is wa- there is wildlife <laughs> around. Um, interesting though, a lot of our girls have never, we actually take them on safari because some of the girls from the city, even though they're living in Africa, have never seen the big five. They've never seen the lions and the leopards and the hippos and the uh, giraffes. And, and they they get as wide eyed as our kids do when they see really? them. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's, I, I noticed some of your imagery, um, obviously you're out there, you're teaching and, and you're really helping there, but you're also taking pictures while you're on location during yeah. the safaris mm-hmm. and your images of the lions and the jackal image. Oh, is that amazing? It's just like, <laughs> I was looking through your portfolio and I stumbled across all of these and, and yes, we are, a uh, uh, a human interest based podcast, but you yeah. have anybody out there listening, you have to go and take a look at some of this wildlife imagery, especially this jackal images. It's just, yeah. it's an animal you're not going to see. No. Um, and not something that's usually in zoos or anything either. Yeah. Um, fairly rare animal in that record. Yeah. It, how close are you like when you're doing that? And um, even with the kids? Not, I mean, I've had a lioness uh, 10 feet away. Oh. Um, as long as you're in the vehicle, you're, they ignore you. Completely ignore you. Yeah. Um, if you step out of the vehicle, you're lunch. See, that's that's. I'm thinking like Ghost in the Darkness type of, you know, the old Val Kilmer <laughs> right, movie. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna drag my ass out when yeah. I'm in the campsite at night. <laughs> oh my god! But I, uh, it, it's pretty. I you know, it's one. Of, it's one of those things where you just. It's it's a bucket list item. You you really need to go to the Masai Mara to the to the which is the Kenyan side of the Serengeti. Mm-hmm. Since you cross the border, it's no longer called the Serengeti. It's called the Masai Mara. Mm-hmm. Um, but that whole area, the wildebeest crossings, and you know, we've seen you know, these giant alligators kill a wildebeest and then drop so the wildebeest. like Nat Geo right at the edge right of the water. There, I mean, right there. We have, I, we, we have a, I have a se- series of a sequence of uh, the wildebeest trying to get away, the two giant alligators killing it, and then seeing a baby hippo nearby, deciding to go after the baby hippo, and then the mama hippo looking and going, that's not going to happen, and charging them. And Oh, that, hippos are extremely most, dangerous. Most dangerous animal in Africa. Yeah, it's like, looks cute from afar, but it will eat your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the videos of them like just, just, just trolling through the water and then chasing the boats and everything. Yeah. And something that huge, being able to move that quickly yeah, yeah. in water is is terrifying. It, it really is a circle of life thing out there. It really is. Yeah. yeah it's kind of like Australia. It's like everything around will kill you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, where do you see this going? I mean, do you have any plans to expand or well, change I'm a, anything? I'm or? on the board. Mm-hmm. And so our... You know, our basic thing is to raise money for Jiraja Academy, mm-hmm. and um, we would love to expand the school. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's, we're still in trying to you know, keep this thing going. We have 130 girls on campus at any one time, full, uh, complete African staff. Um, and, it, you know, on one hand, we want to expand the school. We'd like to triple the size of the school, right. but we need the money to do that. So we're talking about, you know, putting together an endowment of a few million if we could possibly someday do that. Right. And keeping that going and, and uh, getting some more endowments and getting some more, um, some uh, grants. and Is that kind of how everything's sustaining now? Or right now it's mostly donation? big donations, donations, sponsors. You guys do anything online, any like GoFundMes or we anything? Do. do you have a, we, if you want, definitely share a link for anybody out there that might be interested okay. in. Uh, yeah, it's, it's daraja-academy.org. It's D-A-R-A-J-A-academy.org. Um, we do sponsor a, um, a beta breakers every year. Um, you've seen some of my beta breaker shots yep. and some of that is because I shoot for the school, which we do this as a fundraiser every year here in the U S and so on any beta breakers day, we've got 50 to hundred runners here raising money for Daraja while at the same time, those 130 girls at the school are running seven and a half miles there for their own beta breakers. Wow. Yeah. So just kind of linking these two things together yeah. from across the world. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very cool. That's amazing. 
No, I mean, in working with them and, and on the photography side of things, um, do you do workshops here in the States as well? Or is it primarily focused there in Kenya or that kind of? It's been pretty much in Kenya. Okay. Yeah, here, here what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I co-lead a, a street photography work group. Okay. And through our, through our photo club. Cool. And, That's actually, yeah. we can shift towards sure. that. That's actually a really good segue there. Are you mm-hmm. talking about the Marin? Marin Photo Club, yes. yes. So go ahead and yeah, expand okay, so a little bit inter- about what this is. So this is interesting. Yeah, it, and it kind of, it's the second half of my photography career per se. You know, as I was saying, most of my early stuff over the years, and I never thought, you know, when you asked me to be on this, I'm thinking, well, what do I know about photography? How much have I done? I got nothing to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's and I what re- everyone says. Yeah, yeah, and I realized from the time I got married in 1975 to the time I got my first digital camera in the early 90s, I have a a book of photos. I mean, uh, we're talking an album of packed with photos for every year. So you already have your retrospect. So I already place. have that. It's all, it's all, it's all record shots. <laughs> it's all target shots, you know, you know uh, uh, snapshots. Right. Right. So, which the, doesn't, I mean, doesn't negate that from no. potential, you know, project or sequence. I yeah, mean, some, yeah. some of the best books I've seen out there, are just snapshots that were well put together. Yeah. 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 But go ahead. Sorry. So um, mid nineties, I'm coaching baseball and soccer uh, for my kids. And, um, at the end of one of the, my last, my son's last baseball season, there's this parent who comes out of nowhere, hands me and my assistant coach these albums. And I, I never noticed him. And he'd been standing on the sidelines, I guess, the entire season taking great photos of our team. And it was just like, wow, this is really cool. So the next year, my son has moved from me as a soccer coach to having a professional coach who made it really clear, I don't want anybody coaching on the sidelines. Oh, so you, you were told to move yeah, along then. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you know, here's me, you know, you can tell I tend to talk. Um, I'm thinking, all right, what do I do? Well, you know what? I'm going to get a camera and I am going to take photos from the field, which keep me quiet. And at the end of the season, I'll put them together in a little CD and give them to everybody. And so this parent from baseball doesn't know that he actually launched my second career here as a photographer. And that's what I did. So I did that all through his, my, my son's club career through high school. Um, I've shot some Pac-12. Um, he doesn't play, but I've right. got, gotten through there. And so I started shooting with a point and shoot. Then I, um, being cheap, not wanting to buy a bunch of stabilized lenses, I looked around and Konica Minolta had in-body stabilization in their old uh, uh, their old 5D. Mm-hmm. So I bought a, the, the last Konica Minolta ever made, which was the 5D, and then Sony bought the line, and I've been a Sony fanboy ever since. The A700, 77, 99, 7. I'm now a 7R2. Oh, you weren't screwing around. You were like, it is Minolta oh, or die. That's right. And Sony's <laughs> been so innovative. I mean- Yeah, the, well, the, with the help of Minolta. <laughs> with the help of Minolta, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, and- um, <clears throat> Probably one of the best acquisitions they've ever made. Oh, man. At least in the photography sense. Yeah. And these new cameras are just, they blow me away. True. Yeah. So- um, Low light capability is uh, magical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in, um, uh, as my son, as my kids went on to, to college, I started looking around for, all right, what do I do with my photography? And I wanted to find meet other photographers. And so I Googled and sure enough, here was a Marin Photography Club. Oh, all right. Let's go check that out. Joined that in around 2009. And the way this is structured, and it's one of 16 clubs that's part of the Northern California Council of Camera Clubs, which is n4c.org. They do two competitions a month. They have an educational night. Um, They do a variety of other uh, other events. I think we have about 140 members. All of them amazing photographers. I mean, there are people coming up as well learning mm-hmm. but some amazing artists and photographers in that in this group so it pushed me into into competing in things i would not have thought about nature creative travel journalism um pictorial making Just making photos look nice taking that perspective and moving at 180 yeah, degrees and yeah, yeah. opening up rather and so i started doing that and then because i think of who i am and my interest i found myself doing a lot of events, uh, mm-hmm. volunteering, you know, again, beta breakers. Um, I'm usually up on, up on Cardiac Hill during the Dipsy race in Marin. Um, in fact, I just sold one of those images to Delta Sky Magazine for the, their Ooh. October issue. How Congrats. about that? Yeah. Congrats. I actually have some money coming in. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> money for photography. Money for photography, yeah. It's like that full size spare. <laughs> yeah, if you're, ever wondering, if you're ever wondering why you put keywords on images, uh, that's how they found my image. No shit. So, yeah. So I started doing lots and lots of events, and 
spent some time on the streets. Um, there's actually, I, I think I sent you a video this morning the from slideshow. 2014 where I found I had gone to, I mean, I was at, it seemed, seemed like every event. I noticed that. Yeah. It's every, every single image is like, there's another one. There's, it, it's like 365 events in that year. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, but that's San Francisco. That, there's always that, something going on. There is. Yeah. What fa fabulous. Yeah. From drunken Santa's running down the road to oh, naked man. people running down the other road. <laughs> <laughs> Or the How Weird Fest. I mean, you oh, can yeah, just yeah. go on and on. It, it is so much fun. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been to the Folsom Street Fair. and Oh, yeah. And oh, isn't that a I, I unique tell, thing? I tell people, you know, first of all, the first year I went, 90% of the images I took were ready to melt my sensor. I can't show them in public. <laughs> yeah. And this, yeah, I went back this year and and figured I'll, I'll shoot the things. I don't need to shoot a whole lot of, you mm -hmm. know, penises and breasts. It's like <laughs> there's other things here going on. Oh, welcome to San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, one of my favorite images there from last year was as I'm walking out, um, the, this couple had walked in. I don't know if they walked off a cruise ship or not, but it's an older couple. He's in shorts. They're obviously, whatever. It turns out they are, they are seriously from Kansas. And they're talking with a couple who, here's a guy who's like half dressed. He's got a chain around his girlfriend's neck, holding onto it. She's half dressed. And this, this couple is like, oh, so what are you doing here? What is this? What is this all about? You know, it's like, you know, my caption is, you know, this isn't Kansas anymore. <laughs> Wait, do they see Tyke Puppy coming in behind oh, them? Yeah. <laughs> the little dude in the yeah. dog, the leather yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sisters of perpetual motion. I yeah. mean, you have just a smorgasbord. That's, that's what I love about this city, though. It's just there is so much to see and there's very little. Well, there's becoming more and more, but there's far less filter. Yeah, yeah. Compared to other cities. Yeah, and if you want to segue from into street photography, yeah. if you want to get, if you want to get, you know, if you're a photographer and you want to learn to approach people and learn build your to confidence, build your confidence, yeah. doing these events. Yes. For me, it was those sisters of perpetual indulgence at a, at a at an event a couple of years ago. Yes, that's right. I screwed up the name. Yeah, Thank no, you for that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, where. Uh, you walk up to them and say, "Can I say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, would you like me? Yeah, don't I look nice?" And and you get that confidence, and then you translate that into being a little more comfortable meeting people, pe approaching people on the street, and then a few more people on the street, and overcome that fear. You overcome that fear. Yeah. Um, and it's a it's a wonderful kind of atmosphere to do that because everyone is so receptive, everyone is so welcoming. That's right. Um, as opposed to jumping straight into it uh, in the mission, for instance, yeah. you know, yeah, jumping yeah. on 16th in the mission yeah. and drying <laughs> your hands. Yeah. I do carry cards with me. I started after that. That's a good and, idea. Yeah. And so handing them and saying, look, if you email me, I'll send you a, a photo. Mm -hmm. And doing that on the street these days makes it even easier for somebody to say yes to you if, if you're doing how, a portrait. It's yeah. unbelievable how few people actually carry cards. Yeah. I mean, it, it oh. baffles me, um, especially mm -hmm. long-term photographers. It's just, oh, I'm, you know, it just slipped my mind or I didn't have them today. It's like, you should, if you have a wallet, yeah. have some cards in it. Exactly. Always. Yeah. Because you yeah. never know what you're going to run it. Hell, I, I carry a square around just in case. Exactly. You just never know what's going to come up. And as a photographer, you always have to be looking for that next opportunity. That's right. Yeah. Uh, just like the, the print you just sold or the, yeah. the yeah, image yeah. you just sold. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. As far so, as um, so anyway, you know, I've been member of the club. Um, Doug and I met at one of those events. And oh, yeah, Doug, Doug K. K. Yes. And um, somewhere along the line, we were shooting on the street. We started, he, I, he literally is my mentor, you know, of all the people. I mean, I can look at- a good at, mentor to have. He's a good mentor to have. Yeah. I, I look at, you know, my influences of, you know, you go back to Joel Meyerowitz and Valerie Jardin and uh, Melanie Einzig and Christopher Agu, who does, uh, from New York, a bunch of New York photographers. And I can look at those, but in terms of who's been the biggest influence, it's probably been Doug. It's a, you know, he's one of those people who just is, I mean, he's into this. He loves yeah. this kind of thing. He also has a technical background that yes. a lot of people don't have. So you know, he passed me an article the other day on ISO invariance and other people go, uh, what exactly is that? Well, it's the ability to pull detail out of the shadows on some of the newer sensors so that instead of, um, so when you, um, if you want to get detail, they say, well, you know, you want to push push the highlights up to where they're not blown out. and But but a lot of people think that you won't be able to get detail from the shadows because it hasn't captured enough data in there. And with the newer sensors, you actually can pull an awful lot out of there. And some of these articles or some of the evidence now says that um, rather than having to turn the ISO way up, 
you can turn it up enough to not bring a lot of noise in and still pull pull in enough information from the shadows that you end up with a balanced image. It's important to say that's raw. Raw. Yes, yeah. raw. Yes, just, it's just, important to say raw. <laughs> we get, I'm a Fuji shooter, so a lot of the Fuji uh, people, it's like, well, JPEG. But mm, no. in this case, it's raw. Is yeah, I only shoot raw. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at any rate, um, Doug and I were talking one day, and he said, you know, we should get a group together, and uh, I'd like to start a, a special interest group within the photo club. It's not only open to photo club members, but it's it, it's most of our members are members of our photo club. And um, open it up and focus on street photography. So we've been doing that for about two years. And the way we've structured this is- Is this pro bono? Uh, no. Okay. No, this is through the Marin Photo Club. Oh, this is it, the it's same. It's a street photography special interest group. Ah, uh, okay. So you you kind of like segmented it down. Yes. I see what you're getting yeah. yeah. And we have 15 or 20 regular members. Um, and what we do is we get together and we give everybody an assignment, a challenge, what we call a challenge every month. And the challenges include um, light and shadow, uh, motion, up and down, street candid, street portraits, street still life. Um, um, I think I had a couple others I would think about. <laughs> things like uh, stages, oh, yeah. layers, reflections, uh, putting multiple images in, a, in the same frame. Create depth. Create depth. Yeah, echoes. Like yeah. Just kind of working the yeah. usual structures. Yeah. And we send everybody out for a month and we say, come back and give us... <laughs> Sorry, I'm bang, banging your microphone. <laughs> Wake up, everybody. Yeah. Uh, give us three images. Yeah. And then what we do in a salon format, not a competition, but just let's look at them, decide whether it's a street photo or not. Um, we don't care whether it's color or black and white, although one of our themes was black and white. Uh, another one was, you know, color. Uh, and, um, and then just talk about them and see what makes, why people put them in, why they think it's a good image. And that's what you're saying where you guys come back together for the salon. We come back for the, together for the salon. We meet once a month. And what we just did was um, I was thinking after a couple of years that, okay, we've got all these techniques. We've done, you know, 15 different types of challenges. We all have them in our toolbox. Let's everybody pick a technique, a style, a theme, and come back. And instead of giving us three images, put them together as 15 or 20. And oh, so you're creating do a project. Do a project. And Doug said, you know, great idea. And let's take it a step further. And why don't we ask people if they want to to print their projects, go to the Blurb or met their Blurbs. Um, they have a, a, another company called MagCloud. And these things are ridiculously cheap, six bucks to do a 20 page book. And I think I brought a couple of them today. Yep. And a few of these, kind of like zines. I could, mean, yeah. Best exactly. way to describe them. Yeah. Um, and it's been fun. And, and so this, actually this month and next month, we are coming together and showing each other our projects. So I, I and you're doing these zines collectively, not individually. Individually. Oh, you are doing these individually. We, yeah. so, so everybody kind of comes to the table with their own. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So we still show them on the screen and, uh, and then pass around the, these, these zines and, and people are looking at them going, well, this is going to be a great Christmas present. I'll, you of know, course. Print out a bunch of these and. Yes, I mean this is this right here is is a perfect example of something like we do a uh, secret print exchange yeah, every every okay. year, and, or at least this is second year. Um, it will be every year, and um, we usually have somebody always drops in zines when they it, the yeah. intention is just send a print, but everybody kind of goes above and beyond. And so I got messages last year of people receiving prints and they, uh, or zines and they love them. I yeah. mean, it's just a, a way of being able to tell a story. Um, without words. Yeah. I mean, some people will put some words in there, but mostly it's all visually. Right. Um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So sorry for the interruption, but I just want to pop in and give a nod to our sponsor, Glass Key Photo. Their continued support helps keep our mics hot and we couldn't be more appreciative. Glass Key is San Francisco's premier analog photography shop. And whether you're looking for film, film cameras, camera repairs, or if you just want to pick up some amazing zines created by artists right here in the Bay Area, this is the place to go. They even host a number of events, including photo walks, group critiques, or even just stop in for some all-around great conversations. 
conversation. Located now right off Van Ness in Midtown, you can find the store at 1230 Sutter Street. And somehow, these two amazing guys, Gordon and Matt, keep the doors open seven days a week from 12 to 6 p.m. And they're always tracking down some amazing new products like discontinued film, hard-to-find cameras, and an endless array of used lenses. So when you're in San Francisco, definitely stop on by Glass Key Photo and say hello from all of us here at Street PX. Now let's get back to the show. And you, you talk about, you mentioned pro bono. Um, yes, yes. Let's move to that. <clears throat> so last year, um, with all the marches after the uh, unfortunate elections. and There were a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, there were a couple of those protests yeah, out yeah. there. <laughs> there. There was a, a, a guy, uh, Jack Awicki, uh, I think it's his name, um, who started a just decided to get photographers together, invite them to be part of a group called Pro Bono Photo, and offer our services to the organizers a lot of a lot of these groups to document what they were doing. And so, I, of course, I immediately ra- I was already doing that. So I it's like oh, well, I've re- already got the work. <laughs> yeah, I really ra- immediately raised my hand and said, "Sure, I will yeah. do this." And so for the women's marches and the holding hands across the Golden Gate and for the science marches and pretty much anything else we could do, um, I and other photographers will sign up and go out. And like tomorrow, um, Saturday night, I'm doing a Day of the Dead celebration in San Rafael. Oh, yes. Uh, Yeah. And doing that for the organizers. So go out, shoot for them, make the images available to them to use any way that they want for their own marketing or 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 however they want to do it. I've also done some videos. So um, for the women's marches, I threw a, uh, a road zoom, a boom mic on top of my camera, put my street skills to work and walked up to people and said, you know, all right, who are you? Why oh, are you? So you're interviewing, videotaping yeah. the interviews. Yeah. yeah, who are you? Why are you here? What brought you, what brought you here today? What do you hope to come out of this? Will you continue in the future? 90 second short briefs. Uploaded those along with my photos. Uh, so you're kind of doing well. freelance, kind of independent stringer kind of thing. A little bit. And that. are you sending these off to only to the organizations that are funding or sponsoring the events? Or are you also sending it off to publications? Um, I got a, um, a press card uh, about half a dozen years ago, maybe a little more, mm-hmm. with U.S. Press Agency, which is a, I mean, we don't get paid. No. Um, but we put our things online. I've had... Actually, the uh, the Boy Scouts uh, LGBTQ uh, group approached me because they'd seen one of my photos online, asked to, if they could use it for their marketing the next year. I said, sure. So what I do is um, about 15 times a year, I will upload a, a, a um, photo series to U.S. press. And then other press organizations can grab those photos and use them as they wish. Okay. So not not pay, the, the quid pro quo there is I'm not paid for it. But that press pass gets me access to get a press pass with bunches of other events that, uh, where I can say, I, look, I shoot for U.S. press. Um, can I have one of your press passes get into your event and get that kind of access? Because access is everything. Some, yeah, I mean, some ways that's your pay. Just being yeah. able to get to, I yeah. mean, and it's all in the name, pro bono photography. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, you can't call yourself that and go, oh, but it'll cost you. That's right. That's right. And it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a Ouija who said, uh, you know, F8 and be there. Uh-huh. This is the be there part of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, how many people are in the pro bono group? Looks like there's about 25 to 30. 25. Now, between pro bono, the Marin Photography Club, uh, or even you know, that kind of focus segment to this is this fairly open as far as membership? Uh, can people pro, contact? Yeah, pro bono can, if people go to pro bono photo, I think it's dot org, um, they just contact Jack and say, look, I want to shoot. And, and this is a full Bay Area thing. Full, Bay, just, full okay. Bay Area. Um, the, photo- the N4C and the Marin Photography Club is wide open. It's, um, I think our dues are about $100 a year if you're a competing member, $50 a year if, if you're an associate member. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, you meet some amazing, as I said, you meet some amazing photographers. Each of our competitions is is judged by trained judges. So the critique, you, know, you don't always agree with the judge Gooden says. This is true. <laughs> but I've learned to- <laughs> But you, you know, accept it. Yeah, I've learned to not have telephone poles com- coming out of people's heads and oh, yeah. <laughs> policing the edges and all those good things. Overlapping face and face unless yeah, it's Yeah, the rules of thirds, this and that. Yeah. And, you know, I still wing it. I, you know, things look, if a guy's, I have a great image of a guy carrying a big portrait, he's walking off the frame. The judge would look at this and go, yeah, it would be nice if you walk into the frame. Like, I don't care. I like this. So, <laughs> you know, you, it's my image. I do what the fuck I want. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
you know, and f with the club, we also have alternative categories. Mm -hmm. One of those categories is street photography. Right. We do not let the judges judge those. Doug and I ju judge those. I was going to ask, do you have specific, like, seasoned street photographers actually judging the street photography, yes. seasoned nature photographers judging nature? No, the, the, the judges will judge all the main N4C categories, mm -hmm. but only street we judge because we're teaching it. We have our own guidelines. We know what we're looking for. And is there something in the past that occurred that just like- No, no, okay. just, just the, the sense that we don't follow the rules. Right. You know, it's, it's, there, there ain't no rules in street photography. It's a different type of thing. It's a different type of thing. We've been doing our challenges. So we know what we've been teaching our members and we're helping them. And now we're learning from them now as much as they're learning from us. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and because we have our own focus on street, where a lot of the judges are are um, fine art photographers or former journalists, they, it's a different view that they've got on mm -hmm. street, and it it's been working out fine. It's, the biases can can have a very bold line. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Now, I mean, as far as as taking taking the street angle there, I mean, what? Let me ask you this question. I'll put you on the spot. Sure. What? How would you define street from your perspective? Because everybody's got their own definition. Yeah. I'm curious of how you would you would describe it for yourself. Um, I can't remember the name of the photographer, but there was a street photographer back in the 40s or 50s, and if you look at his work, you would swear that he was thinking 20, 30 years ahead of what people what will people be interested in to document our life in this era. And so there's a piece of that journalistic documentary um, work that I'm doing. Right. There's also of the, you know, the, the you've heard the saying, you know, make the ordinary extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So looking for those things, looking for those unique people that just stand out, looking for the bit of humor that's there, looking for the juxtapositions that that are just interesting. You know, I, I'm, as I said, I'm a voyeur at heart. I can stand on the street and just watch people forever. The series that I'm doing, the, the uh, Fridays at the Ferry, which aren't always Fridays, but I post them. On, I post one of those. At, <laughs> <laughs> I post one every Friday on Facebook. Okay, so there That's it why is. it's there become it my Fridays at the Ferry. Um, I found a location where people come out of the dark into my camera. I stand there. I look at my waist. Um at the, you know, just at the monitor. They, I never make contact, eye contact with them, but they're coming out and the sun lights them up as they hit the sunlight. And I love going through, I've taken hundreds of pictures there. And I, and it's like Christoph Egu taking his pictures on the f subways of New York, the same kinds of portraits. If you look at these and you see the differences in people and every single one's got a different expression, a different look, they're deep in thought, they're Licking ice cream, talking on a on a phone or with other people. Some I, of them make contact with me. They 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 realize there's a camera sitting standing in front of them. <laughs> What's this guy doing? Yeah, <laughs> I love these kind of images because the isolation. You are truly focusing on the subject. You're not. I mean, there's a lot of street photography that uh, utilizes the environment around it to be able to create the scene, the yeah. setting, so forth. But I, if anybody out there knows my work, I I have a heavy lean toward high contrast or isolation in this mm -hmm. regard. Um, and and that's what I love about these. Are you kind of aiming you, for the f eleven f uh, f eleven or sweet sixteen there uh, five hundred? It's I'm actually shooting uh, like minus three stops because the where this particular place is, um, there's overhead light that comes down at a certain time of day, and literally these people are coming out of sh total dark shadow, mm -hmm. hit this light, and I almost don't have to change settings. I just um, shooting at about one four hundredth because they're moving, um, mm -hmm. uh, pretty shallow depth of field. Um, yeah, notice that two point eight somewhere in there maybe. Oh, so you yeah definitely yeah. opening it up a lot. Yeah, high ISO because my camera does high ISO. Hey, um, Sony. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Models are using. That's right. That's when I was in New York. I found uh, myself for like two hours just loitering at this one construction going on. Uh -huh. So they had the scaffolding. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was midday. So oh, and they come out of that scaffold. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> and it was like a perfect shaft of light. And mm -hmm. that's what I do. Like I, I, I walk around town and I look for these these shafts, these shafts of lights. Yeah. I know there's a place like in um, a financial district, the building with the huge columns, the big wide columns. Yeah, yeah. About oh, yeah. three, four o'clock in the afternoon, are. you get those, those those shafts of light. Yeah. 
gorgeous work. Yeah. It's just, it, it is kind of a, a redundancy thing. It really, like, as far as technique. Yeah. But people are stranger than any. That's kind of something yeah. I like to think about because every person that's going to come through that shaft of life is going to be different. Mm-hmm. Taller, shorter, different complexion, facial expressions, hats, shirts, so forth and so yeah. on. So even though you are using the same technique, you are getting something different every time. That's right. Fridays at the Ferry is a perfect example of this. Yeah. Yeah, There's, you can put a link to that. I've got them on online. You get these available I do. for oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and do you is this kind of an annual thing, or is it you do this kind of once a year? This or? was this was actually part of the project that we were doing for our street photo group. Uh-huh. Is me putting this together. Um, most of them are online. So each of your projects, this kind of kind of further kind of kick that a little yeah. bit. Um, each of the projects, your goal is to have some type of material uh, result in the end, be it That's, these zines or... Yeah, I think this is the first time we've done these zines for yeah. the, the street group. Mm-hmm. And the reaction, the the response was so positive that I think we'll end up probably doing this once a year. Oh, that's and just that's brilliant. Yeah, people love, I mean, they just love the outcome. And you look at some of these, you know, these dancing in the street. And um, um, Marnie Walters, who's going to be my co-president with the in the photo club next year. Um, um, did these from around the, she did this from around the world. I mean, there's, She's everywhere in this. The dancing in the street yeah, one? she's in Rio and she's in Mexico and she's in Spain. And So it kind of becomes a bit of a travel book. It becomes a, a bit while. of a travel book, but it's all street. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking before the show, you have this central spread, this kind of mid spread here, because yeah. uh, you you do a lot of ballet work, dance work. Right. Um, and it's got this gorgeous like kind of rim lighting on the two dancers here. Um, do you want to kind of expand on this a little bit? For, yeah, yeah. So and I'm um, going to put this into the show notes so our crowd can sure, see Sure, sure. My daughter is a, a a professional dancer. She dances with a contemporary ballet company in Portland and is also a graphic a graphic designer. She she uh, works for a couple of ballet companies here. And about half a dozen years ago, um, I forget how the conversation started, but it ended up with me now for the last half dozen years shooting for two dance groups. You always get these jobs just by in, indirect that's the way chance. It, hey, that's life, right? Yep. Yeah, just yeah. <laughs> that's photography too. Yeah. And so time. now, and then when she moved to Portland, the dance company said, "You're still going to shoot for us, aren't you?" <laughs> yep. <laughs> Don't leave us. <laughs> which, which again, a quid pro quo. You know, it's yeah. like I give them all my images. They use them for their their posters. They use them for their um, uh, the uh, what do you call it when the main company oh, the brochures has their brochure and has their program for a night. There's always one of my images in there for the two one of their. The two programs they have is one is a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts training program that's lines ballet in conjunction with Dominican University. Playbill. Yeah, Playbill. That's Playbill. the word. Playbill. My wife, yeah, my wife's for that theater. One. I think she'd be mad at me if I didn't think of that yeah, word just now. Right, right. <laughs> okay. get it out there. Um, and the other one is a, a pre-professional program they've got in the city that's also a training, uh, dance training program. Mm-hmm. But it gives me the opportunity to shoot amazing dancers. Um the uh, the lighting is uh, hit or miss. The, uh, the when you're on at Dominican <laughs> University, I mean, having a a, a fifteen stop dynamic range is is a good thing. Yeah, shooting theater is <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, in it, the in the city though, this is shot at Mission Dance uh, Mission. It's called uh, Dance Mission Theater mm-hmm. um, on on Mission, and uh, I forget what the cross street is. But the choreographer was he likes going dark. Uh-huh. And so for this image, the theater was al- almost blacked out, but there were curtains in the back and he o- partially opened the curtains. And so there was a little bit of light filtering through and you ended up with the dancers almost in silhouette. And interestingly, I, Doug came with me. I've invited Doug the last two years to be my wingman to, I said, look, shoot, I'm going to, ca- I'm going to do the, I'm going to capture what's on stage do anything you want. If you want to use a longer lens, if you want to experiment, go do that. It gives us the opportunity to do that and not miss anything. Doug and I actually ended up taking this particular shot um, about, we were, must couldn't have been more than two feet apart and maybe an eighth of a second apart. And then when we went home and processed them, the processing came out totally different than anything either of us had ever done before because of the way the room was so dark. And so we did the silhouette and I laughed when I saw this because he actually put this in competition and it popped up in the screen. I said, did I put that in tonight? <laughs> no. I didn't post that. <laughs> I didn't Wait post that. Um, but it's a spectacular shot of these two dancers. Um, again, they're all gorgeous. They're silhouetted. There's rim light around both of them. You can see a little bit of the window. The symmetry between the, the two. And then he, when he put this in his zine, um, he set it up so that their hands are right at the fold. Mm-hmm. So it's... Yeah. And it's not a it's not a uh, one of those kind of harsh um, 
the part in the middle because uh, you have it actually in the center center fold where the staples are so you don't have to crack this thing open and right. pull it hard it's, yeah. it lays flat well here and it looks amazing um but you, you were saying as far as you guys ended up with the same picture, eighth of a second apart, did you both end up with the exact same type of uh, processing as well? We, that's, that's, that's the thing that blew me away is that we ended up going our separate ways, but processing it exactly the same way because what we f I'm, I'm sure what we found was it was the only way to process it and have right. it come out. Right. There, was just, there was no way to bring out any more detail in the dancers. and Like chess, like the, you, know, you, you, you do the, the chess problems. There's only one direction yes, to right. go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's, this is great. And it's all black and white, it looks like in this. Yeah, Doug's... Uh, Doug, oh, there's some color yeah, a little bit. Doug f tends to focus a little more on black and white in his, in his street work. Mm -hmm. um, he had been for a couple of years talking about doing a an Into the Light theme. And mm -hmm. so this having this project as part of our, our uh, special interest group gave him the opportunity to put this together. Mm -hmm. He does... He is somebody for the last few years, though, actually puts a book of his photos for that year together yes. and gives it to friends. I've heard about that before. It just kind of creates, and just kind of a preface for our re, our listeners out there: if you do take a look at this into the light, it is predominantly street, but it looks like there were some uh, kind of uh, a scenic, like the saw. Oh yeah, we've got like the F fifteen yeah. here, and yeah. this amazing looks like the redwoods, maybe up in Marin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, those are some amazing trails to walk. I yeah, mean, I know yeah. I, I tend to focus on people, but it's nice to just go for a hike for a while and get away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Magnificent. I, I, I once figured out that I'd spent a, a full year of my life in t living in tents. Oh really? Yeah, between oh, Boy but, Scouts and other things. Yeah. yeah well, you're also uh, kind of we, when we opened up the show, we were talking about your work in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, your accommodations? Is it just like we're in bandas, which are uh, uh, round huts with thatched roofs? And I'll tell you one story there. Um, yeah, bring it on. We love stories here. <laughs> so the first two times I'd gone out there, um, was out there with my son and with a, you know, uh, and living in living in the small Bonda right on campus. And for the third time I was out there in 2013, they decided I was coming out of kind of an off time for this transition program, uh, with this gap year program. And they decided to put me in the VIP Bonda, which was this big thing up the hill away from everybody. You got the big bungalow. I got the big bungalow. Yeah. And it's got, it's two stories. <laughs> hundred square foot. No, I'm just kidding. It, well, it's just about, um, yeah. it's, it's got an entryway. It's got a, uh, a bedroom with a queen size bed in it, and Ooh, bathroom. I mean, cool. Fancy. Totally cool. And it's the rainy season. So turns out, I, so I get up there and um, I'm getting myself ready for bed and I hear what sounds like rain on the windows. So oh, I'm shit. here, tap, 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 tap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like that. Um, and so I go into the bathroom and I open the curtains in the bathroom and there are 10,000 bugs be trying to beat their way into the place. And I'm like, oh gosh. So I walk out of the bedroom into the hallway and now they left the lights on for me and I'm just like, whatever. So nice of them. It's just so a nice beacon. The bugs are coming over the front door, under the front door. <laughs> They are raining from the thatch. I mean, literally, they're raining from the thatch. Thousands, tens of thousands of these little one-inch bugs. Incoming plague. And I am like, on one hand, I'm horrified. I'm just like, this is like a, a B movie from the 50s. You know, it's like, whatever. And the other hand, I'm thinking, I need an umbrella. <laughs> so I turned off all the lights. I swept them all out and whatever, but- uh, Did they give you a net, like one of those bed nets? Well, I didn't have one the first couple of nights and uh -huh. I, I basically didn't sleep for two nights because you just, even though you tried to sweep them all out, I mean, there were tens of thousands of these Oh, things. yeah. So I think on the second or third night I was there, I wake up at two in the morning and I see this glint on the ceiling and I realize there's a hook there. And so I'll shout out to my friend, Jessica Danforth, who was the volunteer coordinator at the time. I, next morning I said, Jessica, get me a net. <laughs> Just just make this thing one big ass T piece. That's right, that's right. Yeah. I ran into her last week. She said the net's still there three, four years later. <laughs> <laughs> Which what she's telling you is you can go back now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of those videos that I've seen, the net geophotographers. Uh, I mean you Yeah. You don't really uh, you don't really realize how miserable some of these settings are because oh, you yeah. you see it from afar, a third person, these videos and so yeah. forth, but I mean, you're dealing with a, a mosquito infest, uh, a, a swarm that looks like a cloud. It's a really different life. You see things there, um, and you photograph things there yeah. that you wouldn't normally see. I mean, I've got a, I've got tons of other bug stories. Um, I'm yeah, sure I'm not going to share them. Right. I'm sure we could we could spend three episodes just yeah, on that. But interestingly, I was talking about these bugs to um, to a friend 
uh, a, a Kenyan friend a couple of days later. And he said, oh yeah, he says, when it's really, when there's a drought, he says they're termites. And he says, when there's a drought, my grandmother used to fry them up for breakfast. It's protein. Like, wow, like a bowl of rice, just termites. It is. I'm shooting a movie at the Mill Valley. It's in, at the San Rafael Theater in Mill Valley on, uh, sorry, in San Rafael on Sunday night. The movie's called Bugs. And it's a documentary about pe- these folks who went around the world looking at what people eat. Um, Wait, you say you're shooting this? I, I'm, um, I shoot for the Mill Valley Film Festival. Oh, let's... And after the film festival, they said, does anybody want to shoot during the year? Because what we do is we bring in directors and, and talent, and they do a Q&A after the movie. And so Sunday night, there's a movie called Bugs that they're showing, and they're, the, the director is there. So they said, you want to shoot this? I said, sure. We have two free tickets. My wife and I'll go, and then we'll, I'll shoot the Q&A at the end. Just for our listeners out there, I do apologize if you're Googling this right now. The chances are this was in, in the past because oh. <laughs> <laughs> we use time machines here in Street PX. So yeah. we're talking to you from the past here in the future. It's, it's timey-wimey. But you say that – have you been shooting for them for a while? I've been shooting for the Mill Valley Film Festival for the last couple of years, mm-hmm. which is um, – it's a – a, you know, it's a, one of the big film festivals in town. I've shot this this year. Uh, I shot Holly Hunter and um, um, Peter Marshall and um, a whole variety of people. I mean, they they bring in stars. That Amy Adams was there last year. Shot her and really nice. so you know, there's uh, opportunities and they they show forty or fifty movies and if for about half the movies, the talent will be there as well. And so, you know, I, I'm loving getting to watch these movies and listen to the what goes on behind the scenes because a lot of the questions and answers have to do with how you make a how you make a movie and right. lighting and and they, that's a rabbit hole that is oh, deep yeah, yeah. I, i'm kind of experiencing that myself i'm about to move headlong into a documentary uh-huh. and uh We'll see if I come out the other side <laughs> <laughs> with all of, all of my uh, my head, my arm attached yeah. still. But um, it's not an easy thing, and it's it's definitely a whole different mode of operation. Your your I mean yeah. the way you look at uh, the way you look at your uh, your setup, your lighting, video is a whole different beast. Yeah, yeah, and and not just that, but the production. Right. Um, yeah. Are you working on anything like that, or are you just shooting the event itself? Uh, right now, I'm just shooting the event. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, just want to, oh, before I move uh, into the sharing of tips, you're on a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. <laughs> you're telling me about this. I, I got to hear more about this real quick. Wh- yeah. Where, what, why? Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. And when I was 15, the Boy Scouts sent me to their national training center to uh, become a, a leader. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, Norman Rockwell, came around to sh- basically he in the back in that era was creating one uh, painting a year for the Boy Scouts that was on the cover of Boy's Life that was I remember Boy's Life yeah yep. okay okay I had a ton of those things when I was little yeah. yep yeah so um, we're standing at retreat one night uh, with the flag lowering and um, he came around with his guys and one of the guys comes up and taps me on the shoulder and says um yeah, and they were picking people for the for the painting that year. He was gonna he was gonna do it the next morning, and it, what they didn't pick me, they picked my clothes because I was there with you know uh, old shorts, brand new hat, socks that probably didn't match. Uh, you know, I so was, you fit the part. I, you didn't really. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. They said show up and wear those clothes. <laughs> All right, fine. You know, I was fifteen. I was gonna wear those clothes anyway. So. Um, Next morning, I show up and we pose for this this painting, and um, then forgot all about it. And you know, I got my one dollar. I think it was a one dollar check to make it all legal, and a signed neckerchief, uh, you know, with Norman Rock Norman Rockwell on it. And then a year later, the uh, local scout guy comes screaming up to the house and says, "You got to see this!" And it turns out that Norman Rockwell was getting pretty old at that point, and the Boy Scouts wanted him to paint himself into one of his own paintings. So he took some of the images, that because they were all they did the next morning, they took photographs, right? Right, right? So he took some of the photographs of kids who looked interesting, and there were five of us, I think. And here's a picture of him standing at the easel. We're all looking into the distance, and I'm standing there on this, whatever, behind him. 
And I'm, you can still identify me because my hands, I hold on my, my, on my side and my pockets are exactly the same now as they were when I was 15. <laughs> Just as awkward then or? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was like, okay, this is cool. So for a year I was on the calendar, Boy Scout calendar. I was on the cover of Boy's Life. Well, flash forward to the internet, uh -huh. right? And someone says, where is that painting now? I go looking for that painting now. And what pops up is a postage stamp from the country of Liberia. <laughs> and here I am with Norman on this postage stamp. So if there's a claim to fame, the Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame, there it is. That's a hell of a 15 minutes. I mean, to be immortalized by Norman <laughs> Rockwell, this is a, a, the foundation of Americana when it comes to art. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I always thought of him as the Boy Scout and yeah. kind of the, you know, with the four values or the mm -hmm. whatever. Went to his museum. My, my wife and I um, have been spending the last couple of years in New England in the summer for a week and we go to New York and catch some shows, which is an excuse for me to do street photography. Who's going to say? Just yeah. Hit that, hit that <laughs> street photographers, heaven, New York. Oh, yeah. And there's a Norman Rocco Museum. Yep. Uh, up there. And I went and I was astonished at his body of work. If Did you, you see you? Was Were you no, there? I, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm hanging in Philadelphia, it turns out. Um, but I was astonished at his body of work. His stuff from the early 1900s um, is amazing. And it's- And he was he, prolific. He was prolific. And a lot of it, you know, if he had a camera, was street photography. Yep. It was documenting the kinds of things that I would love to shoot. He was painting. Well, his- his primary focus was people. Yeah. And, you know, everything he did revolved in some way uh, a human interest story. Mm -hmm. and maybe not a story written out or expanded upon, but you could read it into his paintings, into his work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I found that was fascinating because it was a it was a revelation to me to see that. <laughs> the, the really left field part of this, I, I mean, obviously outside of Norman Rockwell you were painting you and then adding himself <laughs> to it. But the fact that it's in Liberia. Oh, I know. That's just crazy. <laughs> just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's random, right? Very <laughs> random. Cool. Well, uh, just kind of pivot off of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know we're kind of coming to the end here. So I did want to ask, is there, for our, our, our listeners out there that are just getting into photography, do you have any advice or technique that you want to share? Anything that comes to mind that, uh, like your best tip? That you want to throw out? Well, you just you know, it's the Ouija of you know F eight and B there. It's you've got to go shoot some somebody. I took an image not too long ago, and I don't know what it was. I can't remember whether it was a street photo street photograph or a uh, pelican landing at Las Galenas. And someone said, "Oh, you have the typical question: What camera did you use?" Oh Lord, yeah. And my answer was, you know, it it actually wasn't that moment. It was the 50,000 images minimum that I had taken before that that got me to that point of being able to take that photo at that time. So it's uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where he talks about what does it take to be an expert in something? It takes 10,000 hours to be an expert in something. Yep. It's going out and shooting. And it's getting off manual and learning about the triangle of aperture, shutter, and, and ISO, mastering your camera. And taking risks and getting places where, you know, going out and, and challenging yourself. Find yourself a press pass. Find, find yourself a press pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how important that is. Yeah, yeah. Or, and, and go ahead. Yeah, or, or joining a club like I did. Exactly. You know, it's, it's one of those things where the club is fascinating because it's not just my work being critiqued. I get to see 150 images a night and learn from them. And I'm in awe. I mean, I'm just at this point, I'm like, great story. Bill Valley Film Festival last year. There was a movie called The Eagle Huntress, which is this wonderful story of a 12 or 13-year-old Mongolian girl who trains an eagle, becomes the first girl to enter a competition with all the guys of flying this eagle and tacking this and that. Well, a month later at our photo club, there's a here's that girl with the eagle, and I'm looking going, wait a second, you just can't take a picture of the poster and enter it in the competition. So I go find Catherine D'Alessio, who is the, the photographer. I said, so Catherine, tell me about this photo. She goes, well, yeah, my, my husband, John and I, we, we went to Mongolia because we heard about this tournament and you know, they happened to be shooting a film there. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> how do I compete with somebody who goes to Mongolia or goes to Antarctica or goes to Namibia? Right. That's my club. And, but yet I'm you learning- go to Kenya. I go to Kenya. <laughs> that's right. I go to Kenya. I do dance. People will go, how did you get the dance? Well, I've got access. Yes. Yeah. 
Cool. Well, it just kind of leads us to uh, the last question that we always ask our guest, mm-hmm. and that is, if you had the opportunity to shoot at any uh, in any location since the inception of the camera, mm-hmm. where would that be and why? Okay. Um, thought about that. Mm-hmm. Um, the answer is, I'm a child of the 60s. I mean, I grew up with John F. Kennedy saying, we are going to go to the moon in 10 years, and that's our goal. And if you think back about that very first photograph of the Earth, of the full Earth, yeah, that didn't exist till then, till somebody got that far out to take that image. And I think, in me as a pilot, thinking, okay, yeah. to get that image, what do you need to do? Well, you need to be in orbit, a, be in orbit, <laughs> be an astronaut, get up there, yeah. being able to take those kinds of things. So. Going to the moon, going to space, you know, you asked about, well, since the invention of the camera, I mean, there's lots of, yes. I mean, I can go here, I can go there, I can, you know, I can shoot lions, I've shot lions, I can shoot street, I can go shoot the Eiffel Tower. I mean, there's those things that, you know, anybody could do that. Your choice is Apollo. My my choice would be Apollo and go and shoot in that. Brilliant. Nobody in 50 plus episodes, we've had nobody r- bring up space, especially in the way that you just did. That would, you would have to have the Hasselblad. You would have to have a Hasselblad. Yeah. Yeah. I have to learn how to use Hasselblad. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the changing of perspective of you listen to, um, what's his name? The, uh, the astrophysicist. Um, oh, um, fell from, New, not, York, uh, fell from New York. Um, but you know who I'm talking to and your listeners know who I'm talking to. Yeah. He talks about, space as um, thinking about astrophys- astro um, astronomy and you think about that Apollo program um, it changes our perspective on the world it changes our perspective on who we are and all these divisions that we have on this planet and if you think in those kinds of terms it kind of changes the conversation it really does I mean that you just said that before the 1960s there did not exist an image of Earth. No one nope. had an idea of our little blueberry here. Yeah. And, 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 to, and when that image happened, it's just surreal. Yeah. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson. There yes, it thank is. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> Which our listeners and myself should know because he's somehow the most famous scientist on Earth because he he's just vocal. Yes. Cool. Well, uh, Steve, where can our listeners find out more information about you, see more of your work, kind okay. of the best links? I've got two... Um, uh, photography sites. One is Marin SD. Uh, so Marin, like Steve Disanoff, MarinSD.com will take you to my Smug Mug site, which is my online portfolio. And then there's another site that is Disenhoff.com, D I S E N H O F.com. And that will take you to my Flickr site that's got thousands of other images that are kind of where I put most of the stuff. Uh, but those are the two best ones. I also have a U.S. press uh, site, but that's kind of profile more than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll uh, just kind of for everybody out there go to uh, Street PX, and we're going to add some show notes. Great. Uh, so we'll add links to the Marin Group. So for all of our Bay Area listeners, if this is something that they're interested in becoming and uh, getting involved with, mm-hmm. then hopefully that we can guide them, direct them toward it. Um, so for myself, you can find out more information about me at recasper.com. That's where you'll find all of my past blog posts, any how to's, any workshops that I have coming up as well as portfolio. Um, however, most importantly, you want to go over to streetpx.com. That's where you're going to find all of our past episodes, which we've already, uh, jumped over the, the hump of 50 and moving on toward 100. And, um, so definitely head over there. All of our images, uh, all of Steve's images rather that we've talked about here on today's show will be posted there as well as all links. Um, if you are enjoying Street PX, definitely head over to patreon.com forward slash Street PX and give a dollar, give five dollars, whatever you feel comfortable with to help us keep this show going. Um, and when th- you're not giving something for nothing. You can get free prints, t-shirts, depending on kind of what level that you join. And we definitely appreciate every penny that comes our way. Uh, if you don't want to throw finances at, our, at us, you can always throw words by going to iTunes and shooting us uh, a review. Uh, gold stars. Gold stars are like digital currency and helps us get into more ears out there. Um, and outside of that, much thanks to our audience for listening. And thank you, uh, Steve, for coming on. Uh, it's 
great talking with you. Uh, oh, and before I sign off, Jim, sorry that you didn't get to make this one, but uh, Jim will be with us on the next show. So everybody out there, we will talk to you again in two weeks. Cheers. <laughs>